We have today a talk by Professor Gopi Krishna Deshpande of Auburn University, USA, on a very interesting topic called the science of death. I will introduce the speaker with a few words. Gopi Krishna Deshpande is an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering and heads neuroimaging activities at the AU MRI Research Center in Auburn University, USA. Dr. Gopi Krishna is also an affiliated faculty at the Department of Psychology at Auburn University. Before moving to Auburn, Dr. Gopi Krishna was a postdoctoral fellow at the Biomedical Imaging Technology Center, Emory University, USA. Dr. Gopi Krishna received his PhD degree in Biomedical Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology, USA, 2003-2007, and MS degree in Electrical Communication Engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, from 2001-2003. His major accomplishments are as follows. Dr. Gopi Krishna has published more than 80 peer-reviewed general articles in the fields of signal processing, machine learning, neuroimaging, specifically fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and brain connectivity. He is a co-recipient of the President's Outstanding Collaborative Units Award. He has received more than $4 million in research funding from DARPA and NIH of USA. He has been invited to deliver more than 25 United Lectures in six continents of the world. His research on autism, religion and dogs has featured in various national and international media including a cover story in the New York Times. <coughs> he has collaborated with individuals in 18 different countries. The topic on which Dr. Gopi Krishna is speaking is undoubtedly very interesting and also equally challenging. <coughs> All men are mortal is a famous statement which only tells half the story. The Gita says, Jatasthi dhruvam rutyahu dhruvam janma mutasthicha. Apply sigma to it. Our this chain of births and deaths is never ending perhaps. It is said that over 2 lakh people die every day, yet death remains mysterious. It is said that a meaningful death is better than a meaningless life. A Sanskrit saying says, Ajaramaravat prajnaha vidya maktancha sadhaye grihita evakeshe shumrityuna dharma machare You must have double standards in life. One with regard to earning knowledge and earning wealth, but another when it, when it comes to performing acts of dharma. One must earn knowledge and wealth as though one will never grow old and one will never die. And on the other hand, it is as though the god of death is holding his sword on our neck that one must perform acts of dharma. The Mahabharata gives a beautiful guideline for our life. Purve vayasitat kuriya yena vridhasukhi bhave. Do such acts in your youth that makes you happy when you are old. Yavad jivanche tat kuriya yena pritya sukhi bhave. Do such acts like long as would make you happy post mortem. The art of living, Plato said, is also the art of dying. But nowhere in the world was it practiced as in India. As for example, when Kalidasa said, the kings of the Raghu race could shed their body through yoga. Yogi Nante Danutya Jam. The Mahabharata has a beautiful verse. There is no person who is not afraid of death. But the reverse is said in the Mahabharata. Kritikritya Pratikshante Mrityum Priyamiva Tithim. People are afraid of death, 
precisely because they have not done what they ought, ought to have done in their life and those who have done their duties and owe no dues to any creature in the world it is such people who welcome death as a guest a whole Upanishad leads to the issue of death Katha Upanishad has Yama as the teacher there is a beautiful saying in Buddha's Dhammapadam Apamado Amatam Padam Apamado Machino Padam It is heedlessness that is the same as death and carefulness which is the opposite of death namely immortality The Bhadar and the Upanishad says Mrityorma Amatam Gamaya So lead me from mortality to immortality The Shvetashara Upanishad says Kameyo Viditva Pati Mrityu Medi so one transcends death by knowing the Lord. Much can be said about this from the realms of philosophy and science. So here we have an extraordinary scientist giving his view on the science of death. We look forward to an interesting talk by Dr. Gobikrishna Deshpande. Start with an inner verse by Mira. Wow. 
Um, so this is based on a belief system that incorporates concepts such as soul and afterlife. Um, Indian religions propose a continuous karmic cycle of life and death, as you know, and Abrahamic religions have kind of analogous concepts. But heaven and hell are kind of certain, final and certain there, so it's not cyclical. So I'm not going to be talking about the religious aspects of this topic at all, um, mainly for this reason. So there is no demonstrable evidence in the public domain to either prove or disprove such notions. So this is a little bit of a carefully chosen statement. Let me try to unpack it for you. So when I say demonstrable evidence, um, there might have been some evidence someday, but it cannot be demonstrated today. So this, that's demonstrable evidence. There might have been demonstrable evidence that somebody is aware of, but it's not in the public domain. So demonstrable evidence is but in the public domain is evidence in the public domain that can be demonstrated today. And if this kind of evidence is not there either to prove or disprove such notions. So this is very important because the burden of proof falls on the believer and the burden of disproof falls on the questioner. So these are things that you can neither prove nor disprove. So believe me, disproving is as hard as proving. So there are no scientific studies which either with certainty either prove or disprove such notions. So, but it's a belief system. So I'm really not going into this topic at all, but I'm acknowledging that that kind of views exist. The parapsychology viewpoint um, has developed over the last century. So the parapsychology view, it's called parapsychology because many of the core scientists don't consider that as like hardcore evidence. That's why the word para. So it is the big, there is evidence, but it is anecdotal, but it is reproducible. When I say that, for example, if you take near-death experiences, it's anecdotal because nobody did an experiment to uh, basically measure what happens in the near-death uh, experience, but hundreds of thousands of people all over the world in different languages, different, different countries, different continents, they all um, say that they had similar kind of experiences. So that's why um, it has a little more weightage in terms of evidence because so many people are reporting the same thing across different boundaries and barriers. Okay? So this is the parapsychology viewpoint. And there is a large body of literature which talks about these near-death experiences. So when I say near-death experiences, it's basically somebody almost died, like their heart stopped, but they were revived. Uh, maybe they were given an electric shock or they were some kind of uh, uh, critical care they were given and they were revived. And they, when they were fully all right, they were able to recount what happened during that period when they were almost dead. So this is what I call near-death experiences. And these experiences, there are many of them. I'm going to talk about a few of them. Uh, one you can see here is tunnel vision, life replay. I'm going to talk about tunnel vision later. Life replay is basically a replay of all important events in your life, just the moment before you die. That's life replay, very commonly reported. Many people report calmness and bliss once the painful phase is over. Um, seeing the dead, they report seeing people they know that have already died um, and seeing oneself outside the body. I'll go into a little bit detail regarding this also. This is called out of body experiences, wherein you feel like you are outside your body and you are seeing your body yourself. Okay? So all of these, there's a lot of here, but this body of literature is anecdotal, wherein many people have interviewed individuals who can recall such experiences and they have written it down and somebody here in some village in India has this experiences and somebody in Europe has the same experience there must be some kind of validity to that that's the underlying assumption I will speculate a bit based on the parapsychology viewpoint based on scientific evidence so I am going to touch this topic so the parapsychology viewpoint and the near-death literature, what it did to science is kind of 
it, it, it started to make scientists think about what is life, what is death, and how do you differentiate between them. Okay? I'm going to give you a quote from National Geographic, which very succinctly describes this, um, what can I say, some kind of a dilemma about how to define life and death. The borderline, the borderline is basically the borderline between life and death, is becoming increasingly populated. So a lot of people are basically reporting such experiences. As, as scientists explore how our existence is not a toggle, on for alive and off for dead. That's how common people perceive, the person is either alive or dead. It's not like that. But a dimmer switch that can move through various shades between white and dark. Okay, so it's a continuum and not a binary zero or one condition. In the gray zone, death isn't necessarily permanent. We'll talk about this when we talk about reversible death. Death isn't necessarily permanent. Life can be hard to define. Why is that? Because life and death are opposites, they're antonyms. If, if you have some amount of confusion, confusion defining death, then life can be hard to define. And some people cross over that great divide, that great divide and return, sometimes describing in precise detail what they saw on the other side. Okay, this is a quote from National Geographic. It's, it's a few years old, but it very nicely summarizes how scientists started thinking about this. Then the third viewpoint that I'm going to present is this hardcore scientific viewpoint. This is based on evidence that is demonstrable, concrete, and reproducible, and in the public domain. It consists of papers like this that are peer-reviewed, published in journals like Proceedings of the National Academy, which are really highly respected. Um, other scientists review that and say, okay, I'm fine with that, and it's published. And you can see that people who publish these kinds of studies are hardcore academics working in hardcore academia and also reviewed by people who are working in hardcore academics. So the important point here is I'm going to review a lot of evidence that is there in this hardcore scientific domain, but also touch upon parapsychology. And this is a very important point. This kind of evidence does not necessarily invalidate other viewpoints because this is a work in progress. So the final word, like it's, we cannot still say that, okay, we have really figured out what exactly happens before, during, and after that. So which means that this is a work in progress. So when I'm saying something that what science supports or not supports, you need to keep in mind that I'm not saying that this invalidates the other viewpoints. The other viewpoints are also there. I'm also going to show an example where there is kind of a debate between the hardcore scientific and the parapsychology viewpoint. This is going to be the focus of my talk. Okay. Um, before I actually get into the topic, um, I just want to tell you what is my approach to this talk. Because this, um, the whole, there's so much of information that, you know, there, I have to have an approach to the talk and, you know, confine myself to certain boundaries. I'm not here to share my personal opinions on this. I do have personal opinions, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. But I'm here just to share evidence that's there in science. And you're free to form your own opinions. I neither endorse nor oppose any of the views presented. I'm trying to present this as a neutral observer. I mostly present scientific evidence, but I will do speculate at certain points of time, and when I do speculate, which is speculation is basically not something of some kind of a logic which is not completely based on hard evidence, I will clearly say that I am speculating so that you will know when I am speculating and when I am talking about evidence. Okay? So let's talk about the scientific definition of death. Why do we need the scientific definition of death? I alluded to this a little earlier because traditionally we have just defined cessation of breath and heartbeat as death. Okay? And there were some technological advancements in the past century which made this kind of traditional definition untenable. So what were those? In the 1960s, 
Two, medical developments coincided. This is also from Nat Geographic. High-tech, life-sustaining machinery which blurred the border between life and death. An organ transplantation which made, which made clarifying that border especially urgent. No longer, no longer could death be defined in the traditional way as cessation of breath and heartbeat since ventilators could provide both indefinitely. See, somebody heart stopped beating or the, if they stopped um, respirating, then you know ventilators could provide that indefinitely. So that cannot be the definition of death. Is a patient on a ventilator dead or alive? If you remove the ventilator, when can you ethically retrieve the organs to transplant into someone else? If a transplanted heart starts beating again in a new chest, was the heart donor really dead in the first place? So do you understand the dilemma? So this makes these kinds of things, organ transplantation where you have an organ from a dead person, it transplanted into another person and it starts beating. Or things like ventilators and now you have even high tech machinery which can keep people alive artificially. When these kinds of things come, scientists started asking what really is the definition of death? How do you define when somebody is dead? So in order to answer that question, we really need to go and see what is the sequence in which different organs die. Um, I can show you here, the brain actually dies within four to five minutes of, when, of after the heart stops beating. And then the kidney actually remains alive for 30 minutes, means it can come back and <coughs> start working again. The liver one to two hours, the lung two to four hours. So all of your organs don't die at the same time. That's point number one. Even within the same organ, for example, I have shown here the brain, all of your capabilities don't die at the same time. For example, the first thing to go away would be your short-term memory. That's why many people have difficulty remembering near-death experiences. So people in the near-death field think that everybody has these experiences, but only a fraction of them are able to remember and report that, much like a dream. Okay. So short-term memory is the first to be gone, then cognitive function, motor function, senses, and then respiratory reflex in the brainstem. So that's why you know, doctors look at the brainstem response to see whether the person is actually dead or alive. Okay, so when we look at, at the scientific definition of death, there are two steps. One is called clinical death, which is reversible. So what happens in clinical death is one of these three scenarios. There can be an event that leads to brain arrest. For example, a stroke. It's going to stop blood supply to the brain, then there's going to be brain arrest. When that happens, uh, brain stem is going to go away, it's going to lead to respiratory arrest, and that's going to lead to cardiac arrest and the person's going to die. Or there can be an event that leads to respiratory arrest, like pneumonia, and that, that can lead to other things. Or the most common one is if anything happens in the body, usually uh, leads to cardiac arrest. It can be either primarily the heart not beating because there is a problem in the heart, or problem anywhere else, liver or digestive system, kidney, any problem changes the chemistry of the blood and that actually makes it difficult for the heart to beat because it has to have a specific blood chemistry for the heart to function and that leads to cardiac arrest. This is reversible. Stroke, any person who has a stroke can be revived back. Any person who has cardiac arrest can be revived back. So this is called clinical death, but is reversible. Biological death, on the other hand, is not reversible. So which is basically, if this happens and no action is taken for a while. For example, if there is circulatory arrest leading to death, and then within 30 seconds, there's going to be brain arrest because brain is very hungry for oxygen and glucose. Uh, within two minutes or say maximum five minutes, the cessation of circulation and breathing, with no possibility to resume spontaneously. But you can give electric shock to make it resume, but it cannot resume spontaneously. And similarly, unknown time, maximum of 60 minutes, you know, there's no possibility to resume spontaneous uh, brain activity. I say maximum of 60 minutes because you can do certain things to keep the brain uh, not uh, dissimulated. We'll come to the later. And then, um, cessation of circulation and breathing with no possibility to resume even after interventions. The more the time goes, 
it becomes harder and harder to revive back and there is a one point wherein you know clinical death becomes biological death. So these are the protocols that are there to define death and I wanted to make sure that you know this is understood properly because we are going to be traversing a lot between the grey areas of between life and death so that we need to know where we are in the spectrum. Okay, next. Um, I talked about the viewpoints and how death is defined, what are the dilemmas in defining death. Let's look at the near-death experience literature. Um, I want to show... I want to show a video. about here. So the main thing I wanted to explain is this. So let me go there. as I was saying earlier, there are many different things that happen and there is a debate about near-death experiences. Is there a scientific explanation for these experiences or can science cannot explain all the things that we have observed? So I'm going to talk about both sides of the debate. Okay? First I'm going to talk about the trivial explanation which is basically uh, made by Dean Mobs from Cambridge and Caroline Watt from um, UK Edinburgh and they say that there is nothing paranormal about near-death experiences and they claim that neuroscience can explain seeing bright lights, meeting the dead or being convinced that you are one of them. Okay, um, And this, is, this was a very famous paper published in Trends in Cognitive Science. So let's first look at their argument and then we look at the argument against it. So what is an out-of-body experience? When I first read this, it felt like it's some kind of a horror movie. Because I, I never thought that such thing actually existed. But this is a very commonly occurring condition which has been reported by thousands of and thousands of people around the world. So what happens in out-of-body experience is you have this individual sleeping here, okay, who's almost about to die. And he feels as if he has come out of body. So he doesn't feel that he is inside the body. And he can see himself from above. Okay? And this, what you see here is known as the silver cord. So they feel, so all of these are subjective experiences that people describe. They feel that there is a silver cord connecting them and the body. Symbolically, it means that you know they still feel a connection to the body, but they are outside it. Okay, this is called an out-of-body experience. Surprisingly enough, out-of-body experiences, when people describe it, it uh, they describe it as being a very positive thing. Like they they get they it's very calm. They feel very calm. They f they feel a sense of bliss. They feel very happy when they go through this out-of-body experience. Okay, and this is, I mean, the people in parapsychology have argued that this is 
um, some kind of um, an evidence that consciousness can exist outside the brain. So the mind brain problem. Um, but in this paper, they say that it can be simulated using electrical stimulation of a brain region called the temporal parietal junction. So it's the junction of the temporal and parietal cortices of the brain. So if you take, so this is what they are doing here, controlled electrical stimulation of that region, when this is a paper that has been published, uh, out of body experienced disturbed self-processing at the temporal parietal junction. So just by stimulating that region, people get exactly the same experience. So they are saying that when you are almost about to die, there is some kind of um, a decrease in oxygen and glucose because of uh, cardiac arrest in the brain that actually changes the function of the temporal parietal junction and that can simulate this out of body experience at that time. Does that make sense? So this is one kind of, it, it does not conclusively prove that something actually has gone wrong in the temporal parietal junction when somebody is actually dying. This is kind of reverse inference because that kind of experiment is very hard to do because you don't know when somebody is going to die. They cannot be, they cannot be scanned or the, when they are dying. So this is actually some kind of a reverse inference saying that if I can kind of induce the same effect using something else, then you know, by reverse inference, I can say that this out of body experience is probably because of disturbed processing in the temporal parietal junction. So what the temporal parietal junction does is it gets information about your body, outside sense, it kind of constructs a sense of yourself. Okay, so if you just basically disturb the electrical processing in that area, and the, the that area is not able to construct your sense of self, then you feel as though you are floating outside your body. So this is the logic. So we will we'll see the counter logic for this in a while. The tunnel effect. So I'm going to talk about all the neuroscience explanations. Um, for these out of body, for these near death experiences, and then come about the come and talk about the rebuttal later. The tunnel effect is one of the most commonly reported near death experiences. So, what the tunnel effect means is that many people report that when they are about to die, they feel as though they are moving through a dark tunnel, at the end of which there is some light. Okay, this. Many scholars think is depicted in this famous painting called the Ac Ascent of the Blessed. It's it's done by Her um, Hieronymus Bosch, who was a painter during the Renaissance era, 1505 to 1515, and you can see it in the Gallery de Academia in Venice, Italy. So people scholars think that this is actually a painting which depicts this tunnel effect that many people were probably discussing during that era. So you can see this tunnel here. See the tunnel here, and many people, supposedly people who are blessed, these are Renaissance or are painting, so who are moving through the tunnel. Okay, so how can we, how how do these authors explain the tunnel effect? Let's look at that. So in order to explain the tunnel effect, let's look at the construction of the eye. So this is uh, the actual eye, and you can see all the blood vessels here. This is actually a cartoon. And in the cartoon, what I want you to notice is the blood vessels go from outward to inward. All the blood vessels go from outward to inward. Okay. So what happens when the tap is shut off, if the heart stops beating, then there is an oxygenation gradient. The, all the blood which is far away from the heart gets deoxygenated first. So what happens is when the tap is shut off, the oxygen in the periphery of the blood um, goes off earlier than the center of the brain. So the periphery of the eye goes off earlier than the center of the eye because of this outward to inward anatomy of the blood vessels. So, and they say that when the periphery becomes dark first, there is still light at the center, okay? And that creates this tunnel effect. And this is dynamic because periphery is becoming darker and darker. So you, you, it creates a sensation that there is a tunnel and you are moving through the tunnel and you see light at the end of the tunnel. This is just an explanation, okay? 
This is not proof. So there is a difference between the two. This is an explanation that sounds reasonable. Hypothetical? Hypothetical, yes. Yeah. Hypothetical explanation. Um, and if you are interested, there is a very um, fantastic paper by Blackboard, The Physiology of the Tunnel, 1988, near General of Near Death Studies. So, this is the second um, thing I wanted to talk about near death experience. Seeing dead people, okay, this is like horror movie stuff, like seeing ghosts or seeing people who, know, who you know are dead. So, the explanation that they gave is patients with Alzheimer's or progressive Parkinson's disease can have vivid hallucinations of ghosts or even monsters, and it has been noted that they, they have reported to have seen headless corpses and dead relatives in the house, and this has been linked to paradoxical lesions that these uh, neurological disorders create, suggesting that this results from abnormal dopamine functioning, which is a neurochemical which can invoke hallucinations. So there's a famous paper in brain regarding that. Uh, also, electrical stimulation of the brain region called the angular gyrus can result in a sense of a presence someone standing behind us. So the, the region called angular gyrus, if it is electrically stimulated, you're going to feel that somebody is going to, somebody is standing behind me. Okay? So these, these evidence are quoted by these authors to say that whenever something goes wrong in the brain, whether it's electrical stimulation or lesion or it is some kind of a disorder, then that can lead to these kinds of sensations. Which can, which people interpret as like going through the tunnel or seeing the dead, etc. Et is that is that explanation clear? The good thing about science is that there is always a debate. So after this paper was published in 2011, Bruce Grayson, who's who's known as the father of near death uh, research, um, published a rebuttal in the same journal. Uh, saying how these explanations don't account for all the things that have been reported in the near death literature. Okay, I'm going to give you a few examples. Don't have time to go into all of them. So this is basically still a debate without an answer. So I'm just presenting you both sides of the debate. First point. So near death experiences simulated by pathology or electrical stimulation are usually accompanied by negative emotions. For example, if the temporoparietal junction is electrically stimulated and you feel an out of body experience, it ge also generates fear and anxiety that, oh, oh my god, I am out of my body. However, actual NDEs, actual near death experiences are associated with positive emotions. So in, in, when people almost died and they come back and they live to tell the tale, they actually say that when I was going through that, I was feeling bliss, calmness, and I was feeling happy, a sense of elation. So this is one thing that this explanation cannot explain. Another example, people have reported to have seen dead individuals who were strangers and they did not know whether that person was dead or alive. So these people do studies wherein they take an account, they go and see the circumstance and verify whether that account was correct or not. And through those kinds of studies, they have found out that they were able to see people who were strangers who whom they did not know whether they were dead or alive. So this is another counterpoint against the neuroscientific explanation. Another point is electrical stimulation does not produce a multisensory perception. So I said that if you stimulate the angular gyrus, you feel like as though somebody is behind you, or you hear somebody talking to you or see somebody. So it's always only one sense. You either, you'll either feel or see or hear, but you, not all of them simultaneously. But in actual near-death experiences, people actually see, hear, smell, and touch deceased people. At least that's what they report. Okay. So there are. I mean, this is this is a long rebuttal of wherein he goes point by point saying that this is not explained. This is not explained. So. As I said in the beginning, this is still a work in progress. There are some people who believe that eventually neuroscience will be able to explain all of these near-death experiences. Some people who truly believe, like Grayson, that it won't be possible because they believe 
also because of quantum mechanics and the effect that that has had, that consciousness actually can exist outside the physical plane. Okay? So that was about that. The, as you can see, the problem with near-death experience is that it is anecdotal. It is not a controlled scientific experiment. So, it always happens, he said, they said. It's difficult to say anything definitively. So, in order to move beyond that, people have tried to investigate death and not just near death. Okay? And I'm going to talk about three important aspects when it comes to this. One is, what are the ethical challenges for doing so? So the near-death literature is very huge and large. Whereas the literature looking at actual death is very small. Because of ethical challenges and because it's very difficult to do that kind of experiments. Then I'm going to talk about reversible death and the oxymoron um, reversible death and the irreversible death. So let's look at what are the ethical challenges in humans and in animals. In humans, it's not possible to do a prospective study. What I mean by that is that most of the reported studies are basically data acquired from patients who are in ICU and who happen to die. Does that make sense? So they happen to die and they use that information prospectively. They, they use that information retrospectively. It cannot be done prospectively. And also it is non-invasive. You cannot, you cannot do invasive studies. Um, and also, because it's an uncontrolled sample, it's also very heterogeneous. And patients or their guardians, when the patients are incapacitated, must give informed consent for using and acquiring data. This might actually, um, because of the declaration of Helsinki, this might actually seem like quite innocuous, but it is not. Because if, some, if, some, if, if you're running a study, somebody dies, then you have to go and ask their relatives, can I use this data? They're not in a frame of mind to tell yes or no, because they have to read what the experiment is about and then give consent. That is what is informed consent. So they're not in, in a frame of mind to do that. So many people just say, just leave me alone. Okay, so that's another problem. In animals though, it's possible to design prospective studies well-controlled samples. There are other issues. Animals can be killed for research only when there is a clear benefit to human condition and that is demonstrated. Okay? And in this uh, case, it is difficult uh, as the motive is to understand death. It's a matter of curiosity. I mean, one can argue that this can have benefits in the long run for survival of humans, but no immediate and tangible benefit, so that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to get ethical approval for doing that kind of studies. Okay, so these are the ethical challenges, but now let's look at the actual scientific studies that have been done. Uh, this is the most respected study in the last two decades. It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy um, by this group. Search of neurophysiological coherence and connectivity in the dying brain. So this was done in animals, as you can imagine, very difficult to do this in humans. But I'm going to talk about a few human studies as well later. So let's see what they actually did and what they found. Um, so what you can see here, and this is of course irreversible death. So they're going to get data before they before they anesthetize and the, day, and the animal is anesthetized and cardiac arrest is induced and they continue to get the data after cardiac arrest and there is no attempt to revive the animal. So this is a timeline and you can see all of these data show um, EEG, they also had EMG to look at muscle activity and EKG or ECG to look at heart. Um, then you can see that mostly when you're, the, the animal is awake there is some kind of a pattern. When the animal is anesthetized loses consciousness, the, the pattern changes a little bit. And then CA here is cardiac arrest. And when cardiac arrest is induced, the, the amplitude goes down a lot, but we have to still look at the frequency domain. That's where the story is. Uh, but let's look at what happens just before and after cardiac arrest. Let's zoom in. So you can see this is anesthesia. Um, and cardiac arrest, they have uh, kind of 
separated into different stages and I'll tell you how they have done that. From time zero is when the cardiac arrest is induced and, and at this point there is loss of pulse. So that segment is called uh, CAS1. The loss of pulse due to the delta blip, I mean this is just technical term, all you need to know is they kind of segmented these post cardiac arrest uh, time interval into different segments based on some scientific criteria. Okay? And if you zoom in, you can see that this is anesthesia and this is all of these CAS1, CAS2, CAS3, all of these is post cardiac arrest when the animal is dead. But the EEG activity is not zero. And in fact, if you look at CAS3, there's very meaningful patterns that you see there. And this is very high frequency gamma activity and it is also synchronized. And the same thing is shown here um, in the frequency domain. Uh, you can see here that after, and this is frequency, and after you cardiac arrest, there's some high frequency activity here, more than 10 seconds after death, okay? And this is, this is actually phase amplitude coupling, but I chose this because it, it clearly tells you how the activities are different during these three different states. So waking is here, and you can see in anesthesia, both higher and lower frequency are, are kind of suppressed because there is no consciousness. And what would scientists have expected to happen once cardiac arrest is induced? They expected that this thing and this thing would also go away because the animal is dead. That's not what happened. So what happened was you see this high frequency um, gamma coherence and phase amplitude coupling in the CA, CAS3, which is basically more than 20 seconds after death. What is noteworthy here is this kind of um, this kind of activity that you see after death is unlike what you see during anesthesia and during waking. So people wanted to figure out what is actually going on in the brain at this point of time. Um, as I said, uh, distinct from those obtained during regular wakefulness and anesthesia. So they say that it indicates an intense level of cognitive processing which is typically difficult to achieve during regular wakefulness. Okay, we'll, we'll see what, what this actually means. So, Beta high frequency, beta high frequency gamma actually indicates intense cognitive activity, cognitive processing, but the level is quite intense. And typically, even when you're like, maybe you're solving a very difficult math problem or you're doing a cognitively demanding task like end back working memory task where you're supposed to remember like four or five items and manipulate it, all, all kinds of people have looked at the brain during all kinds of intense cognitive processing. They don't see this kind of pattern. Okay. So this is intense level of cognitive processing, but the rider is important. It's typically difficult to achieve. They say difficult to achieve, not impossible, but difficult to achieve during wakefulness. We will see when it is possible to achieve during wakefulness in a minute. Uh, before that, I want to just say that these results were recently replicated, 2017 in another model, animal model, they also find a similar thing. So you can see here, uh, you have, they call it in different names, AS1, AS2, AS3. What I find most interesting is this line, which is the blood pressure, okay? The blood pressure, so this is, so this is, this is when there is cardiac arrest induced, and after that the blood pressure goes down, and during AS3, the blood pressure actually goes up a little bit. So this is, this is what? This is like after 30 seconds of death. So after cardiac arrest, blood pressure goes down and there is loss of pulse. And after 30 or 40 seconds, there is actually slight bump in blood pressure. The, the heart is still not beating. Okay. And what that corresponds to, this is a time frequency clock. What this corresponds to is this band of intense gamma activity. The high frequency activity that I was talking about. So what they conclude here is the search in frontal coherence 
that we observe during AS3 may be reflective of a heightened state of introspection or attention, whereas the shift in higher frequency power towards the posterior may be indicative of perceptual or sensory process. So they say that, I mean this is all conjecture. Only, only the data is real. How you interpret is really left, left to you, but their interpretation is this intense level of cognitive processing power is actually being used for perceptual processing. They are also seeing and hearing animals in this case, seeing and hearing things. Okay. Um, this was also, I call it a loose replication because in animals they actually put electrodes inside the brain to get better data, but this uh, Canadian group showed that EEG using scalp EEG recordings on the scalp, not inside the brain, from ICU. Um, so they showed that during withdrawal of life sustaining therapy until 30 minutes after declaration of death, they were actually able to uh, record electrical activity in the brain. Okay? And this is in human. So I'm showing this just to, just to tell you that this, is, this has been replicated not only in animals, but also in humans. So, what does this mean? I told you that this is this kind of high frequency gamma coherence and that magnitude doesn't happen during wakefulness, but it does happen during meditative state. And this is where it gets interesting. So, this is a paper which is also published in the Proceedings of the National Academy by a person known as Richard Davidson from University of Wisconsin Madison. So he has been very passionate about uh, studying what happens in the brain when people meditate, especially when uh, Buddhist monks meditate. And he was able to establish contact with the Dalai Lama and his disciples and they, they did some studies uh, in collaboration with this individual called Matthew Ricard. And he's a French national who is in the Sechen Monastery in Kathmandu, Nepal. So that's how they were able to get this data. So what they show is that long-term meditators self-induce high amplitude of gamma synchrony during meditation. So what does that mean? Not only an intense level of conscious processing not seen during regular wakefulness, but these patterns are qualitatively consistent with those seen during meditation during long-term of long-term meditators. I say qualitatively because this has not been. Um, the patterns look similar in both samples seen um, independently. They are not being compared directly using quantitative mathematics or statistics. So qualitatively, they look very similar. Uh, this is the actual data and you can, if you want, you can see this is resting state and as the meditative state starts, you have high frequency gamma. The gamma power goes up and uh, as you can see here, the baseline during meditators the gamma power goes up only in long term. So the, you see this effect only in long term meditators, not pe people who are not long term but they still perform the same meditation. You don't see that effect. Okay. What is interesting to me is I've been talk I've been kind of mixing the literature between animals and humans, but I want to address that issue. So all these data, what this suggests is capability for intense cognitive processing 30 to 40 seconds after death. What it is utilized for may differ fundamentally between humans and animals because human brain and animal brain and their nervous systems are fundamentally different, their capabilities are fundamentally different because of structure. I mean, animals don't have this large frontal cortex that humans have. So they, they don't have language, intelligence, free will, and these kinds of things. So, so what we need to keep in mind is all this data suggests is that you, you get some kind of a superhuman capability at that moment. What it is used for is probably different between animals and humans, also probably different between different human beings. So the near death literature suggests that all, all the things the life replay and the tunnel, all the things that come to your mind at that near death are the things that are most important to you in your life and the things that you were more, most passionate about or spent most amount of time in your life. So, so what it suggests is that 
whatever this intense level of cognitive capability that comes is used differently by different people. I mean, if you are, if you are, if you are passionate about certain thing, your entire life, that is what you are going to use that capability for at that moment. So this is this is my hypothesis. There is no data for this, but this is what I think is going on. Okay, um, I want to give you another example about this relationship of this particular state uh, to meditation, and that is known as Tukdam. Um, I don't know if people have heard about it. So Tukdam is a rare occurrence in which a monk dies. I have dies in quotes. I can explain why it is. But there is seemingly no physical decomposition of the body for a week or more. So the monk is going to say that I'm going to go into Tukdam, which means that I'm going to start meditating, and eventually I'm going to die. But that is my own free will. But once I sit meditating, then I'm done. I'm not going to come back. Very similar to you might have heard the story of Sri Raghavendra Swamiji, right? Very similar to that. So, and what happens is th these monks are rare, but they are still there. And Richard Davidson goes and visits one of these monks who is sitting in Tukdam. And this is what he had to say. If I had just casually walked into the room, I would have thought he was sitting in deep meditation. Davidson says, his voice on the phone still a little awestruck. His skin looked totally fresh, his meaning the monk, and viable, no decomposition whatsoever. The sense of the dead man's presence even at close range helped inspire Davidson to study them scientifically. So this is a study that is going on. Uh, we don't have any results from this study in the public domain, but we know that they are carrying out this study. Basically what they want to do is, once a monk is sitting in Tukdam, go and record some vital signs like EEG, ECG, EMG, and see what is going on. When, like, I mean, if, if the body doesn't decompose, it means they're still alive, right? When I say alive, go back to my initial um, few minutes when I said that you know alive and dead is not zero and one. So there is this kind of a gray state between dead and alive. So, so this is an ongoing study. We will probably once, if and when this study is published, then we will have some good sense about what is going on. Okay, um, my. So, there's a, so, so, for all this data, there's a scientific interpretation, and then I'll also give you my speculation. So, the interpretation is that the dying brain with decreased oxygen and glucose makes a last ditch attempt, okay, at revival, leading to an astonishing surge of activity and an unusual state of consciousness. Very much like how a light will burn very bright before just going out. So, lack of oxygen and glucose, it, the brain kind of puts everything that it has into it. That's why it's able to generate that kind of intense level of cognitive processing that is not seen during regular wakefulness. So, I, I want to make a speculation based on this scientific interpretation and also based on data on how qualitatively that kind of state is similar to the meditative state. So my speculation, this is a speculation, okay, is that irrespective of the interpretation, the unique brain state that is created at the time of death allows the brain to do things that it normally cannot during regular wakefulness. And I think that this may underlie the notion that is there in our culture that, you know, if you are able to remember God during that time that you are going to get realized, that we have like Gajendra Moksha, you have heard of all the stories, right? How that moment of death is so important. So, one possible explanation is that the body and the brain are in that, they are endowed with kind of supercomputer-like uh, abilities at that time. And if you are able to focus that kind of attention on um, a meditative thing or, or some kind of higher consciousness or God, whatever you call that, then you know that is going to lead to some kind of um, a reward for that. So that that might be that might be what underlies that common notion that we have in our culture. Okay. So my, the last thing I'm going to talk about is reversible death. As I said, it's an oxymoron. Death is final. It's the only final thing in our lives. 
So, how can it be reversible? So, can we cheat death, at least temporarily? So, there is a paper in Nature New Biology that was published way back in 1972 uh, by Konikova, Russian Medical Academy of Sciences. It's a landmark and unrivaled study. Nothing like that has been ever done again, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it remains to this day the most unique study in the field and carried out in the USSR, unlikely to get ethical approval. Also, my some, my guess is that this study was done with some kind of patronage from the Soviet army and all details about how exactly it was done, the technology behind it was not shared and so nobody has been able to replicate it. But it's a very interesting study. And it was also replicated by them this, the following year. Changes in protein synthesis after death and reanimation of rabbits. Okay, let's see the experimental protocol. So what they do is they have rabbits and the blood is removed, all the blood from the rabbits are removed. That leads to clinical death within eight, six to eight minutes. So rabbits are going to die if all the blood is removed. Okay. Ten minutes, no action, the blood is cool. So for ten minutes, the rabbit is dead. What happens after that is the cool blood, which is cooled to 10 degrees Celsius, is actually pumped back and artificial circulation is established using external machinery. Okay? Another thing that is done, and this, this is where I think is the most difficult part, is the chemistry of the blood is maintained. So in the body, you have the liver, the kidney, there's an elaborate homeostatic mechanism to maintain blood chemistry, pH levels, hemoglobin, a lot of different things. When you do a blood test, you will see all the different things, right? All those things have a tight range. So that tight range, whatever the body does through homeostasis, uh, must be done artificially. Mm -hmm. that, that is where you think it's most difficult. And that happens for 30 minutes. And at 60 minutes, which is actually one hour after the animal has been dead, no breathing, no heartbeat, no pulse. The blood is warmed to 37 degrees Celsius. So this rabbit is a warm blooded animal, it's a mammal and pumped back, what happens is resumption of spontaneous cardiac fluctuation, corneal reflex and movement. The rabbit comes back alive. That's why I said that this is a landmark study. One hour, the animal was dead. What they did was to cool the blood, cool the body temperature, keep the blood chemistry within its limit, and then when they warmed back the blood, spontaneously, they did not even give a shock, spontaneously the heart started beating, the corneal reflex and movements were observed. Corneal reflex is basically, if something goes near the eye, the, the eyelid is going to close. So that is one thing that people see to make sure the person is dead or alive. Corneal reflex should be there even when the person is not conscious. So all of these came back up. So what they did was to measure protein synthesis at each of these stages to see what is going on, okay? So this is basically bringing somebody back alive after they have been dead for one hour, right? It's quite hard to, to believe and imagine. And why protein synthesis? Because vitality is measured in terms of protein synthesis. Protein synthesis, proteins are the basic building blocks of uh, chemical control. So protein synthesis is assimilation um, in the body. So there's always an assimilation, dissimulation balance in the body. So there's protein synthesis and this, and that is assimilation, there's also dissimulation. Proteins are broken down for various different things. For example, if you, if you are starving, fat is broken down because you need some energy. So, and this balance in, in the healthy system, there is this kind of a dynamic equilibrium. You can have higher assimilation but lower dissimulation, then you're going to put on weight. The assimilation and dissimulation can be the almost the same, then your weight, you're not going to put on weight, or you can have more dissimulation than assimilation when you're losing weight. So this is like this is healthy stuff. Okay. So that's why they measure protein synthesis. Now let's see what happens to these proteins through this experimental protocol. So on um, and also I, I forgot to mention that when they pump the blood back, it's radioactively labeled. 
so that they can actually see what is the amount of protein synthesis going on. So on the y-axis here is radioactivity and that tells you what is the amount of protein synthesis. This is time and these different, um, all these different curves to correspond to protein synthesis in different parts of the body. I'm not going to get into that, but only one interesting observation there is the protein synthesis that goes down slowest is in the spinal cord. Okay. We will not get into that, but I think that has some significance. Anyways, so time zero is clinical time. Okay. For 10 minutes for one group of animals, they pump back warm blood without cooling. But it's only 10 minutes. So what happens is the protein synthesis in all these regions goes back up and the uh, animal becomes alive. But what is more startling is what happens after 60 minutes and as I said before there is hypothermia which is basically cool blood during that time and then revival of protein synthesis. As you can see once warm blood is pumped back into the, in the animal, protein synthesis almost goes back to its original form and the animal is alive again. So <coughs> is this cheating there? So what is going on here? So here's, here's some of the thoughts that can be had from this experiment. So the first three cases, as I said, assimilation, dissimulation, balance in healthy people. The fourth case is what is known as anabiosis. So wherein the metabolic rate goes down so much that there's very little protein synthesis and protein breakdown. And then also the animal can be kept alive. Okay, the metabolic rate is very low. And then this is basically, there's a lot of dissimulation, but by cooling, you are actually stopping the dissimulation at, at a particular level so that it is not totally irreversible. But if you don't cool, then it becomes totally irreversible. Okay, so people have used this concept. So how is this relevant to humans? I mean, you cannot even think of doing this kind of an experiment with humans, but what is the impact that this has had on human society? So I want to just give a couple of examples. Um, one is a company called Alcor uh, in Phoenix in, in the United States, which actually sells a service called Cryonics, where <coughs> you can actually buy this service when you are alive, this is actually there. It's, it's expensive but you can buy this service and as soon when you are about to be dead, they will come and as soon as you are dead, they will secure your body and they will treat it so that it, some of the dissimulatory mechanisms are inhibited and after that they are going to cool the human body to minus 196 degrees Celsius and store it in these different cylinders. So this woman is actually holding this cylinder wherein her husband's body is stored. Okay, at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So what they say is this. One day, medical technology will have advanced enough to fix what led to death. So what, why did that person die? Something went wrong in that body and that could not be fixed. Today. Right? So what they are saying is, just freeze the metabolism in the body at that moment when the person died. And store it at a temperature where no amount of organic activity can ever happen. One day, if there is a cure for that, then you know you can basically um, go in, fix that what has happened. To a simple example is stem cell therapy. You might have all heard about stem cell therapy that people give for things like cancer, uh, wherein Potentially it can cure, but it has not been still approved because they have not done the phase three clinical trial. So if that kind of a th thing comes up in the future, then that person can be made alive at that moment by actually fixing what's, what, what led to the person's death. Okay? This shows you how important life is for everybody. You know, they are dead, but they still want to, don't want to leave and go. With the hope they want that someday, you know, 
they can still come back alive. Anyways, so this is one company which is actually making a huge lot of money doing this. So. <laughs> okay, I also want to give you an anecdote. So I'm doing this, giving this anecdote because there is no comparable data in humans regarding reversible death. That's why I'm giving an anecdote. So this is also from National Geographic and talks about a boy or a toddler called Gardel Market who fell into an icy stream behind his house in March 2015 in Pennsylvania in winter. So there was a stream going behind the house. Um, so Pennsylvania is in northeast um, besides New York. It becomes very, very cold in winter. So the stream was icy. Okay. And he fell there, complained, probably they were, he went to play there, but accidentally fell and then he died. And he was dead for more than an hour and a half. So they found his body in the street, they took it to the hospital and then revival, all that actually took an hour and a half. For hour and a half, the boy did not have pulse, the boy did not have a heartbeat, nothing. It was a dead body. Okay. After an hour and a half, they, he went to the hospital, they warmed his body, gave him CPR, gave him electric shock and heart started beating again. So three and a half days later, he left the hospital alive and well. His story is one of many prompting scientists to question the very meaning of death. So the person was dead for an hour and a half but still could come alive because, as I was saying before, Life and death is not a zero and one switch. There has so so life is like an orchestra, where different organs of the body are coordinating to do different things. We can think of it like an orchestra. If somebody is playing an orchestra and one uh, instrument breaks down, if you continue playing the orchestra, it will sound bad. That's irreversible death. Nothing is done then all the systems will break down because one component is not working. But as soon as one instrument went bad, if everybody else stopped and that person fixed that instrument and everybody else started playing again, the orchestra is, is alive and well. So that's exactly what happened here. That by hypothermia, by cooling the body, by slowing the metabolism, you're basically stopping everything and then the heart was not beating because you know he had drank a lot of water, <coughs> went to the hospital, they gave CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, then heart started beating again, warmed the body up and everybody is into the orchestra again. So what this demonstrates is that the traditional notions of life and death, at least physical life and physical death that people have is wrong. So, death can also be reversible under certain circumstances. So, this um, concludes my talk and I want to just take five minutes for an acknowledgement. Um, any questions so far? By Sriranga Mahaguru and Srimadhi Jayalakshmi Srimadhi, the founding president and the current president of Ashtanga Yoga Vidyalaya. Um, I want to tell you why um, I feel very strongly about this. Because Sriranga Mahaguru advocated using modern science and technology for understanding the physiological imprints of unusual or higher states of consciousness. And this was more than 70 years ago. And nobody even thought about this. Okay. Um, I say physiological imprints because if you say that you know you want to use modern science to understand higher state of consciousness, then there is a there is a problem. Many people think that there is a non-physical element to consciousness. But when I say that, forget about the mind-body problem. Whether consciousness is physical or not physical, but it always leaves certain imprints on the body, right? Those physiological imprints are what could be understood using modern science. Not just that, dissemination of such findings in the language of modern science so that they can be understood and appreciated by the current society which trusts this framework 
because there is a lot of literature in our culture, philosophical literature about these things. Um, but many people today cannot appreciate that or don't want to appreciate that because all that literature exists in a different framework that people then work with. Um, it has to be reinterpreted in the modern scientific framework and he was very passionate about this. Um, I want to give you a couple of incidences from this book, which is a biography uh, written by his close disciple, S.V. Chamu. Uh, second edition, Femini wants to know, chapter 5, page 89 to 93, 2006. So the original material, as you can see, is in Kannada. I have translated it to English, so excuse me if there are any issues with that. Um, I will talk about what is the relevance of these incidences to the current topic that I am talking about, and that will become clear when I finish in a couple of slides. If you need more information, you can go and check out that URL. So the first incidence, we need to go back more than 70 years ago to 1940. Okay? And this was in a village uh, near Mysore, uh, more than 70 years ago. So there was a, an accomplished Ayurvedic doctor called Tayo Subbai. Okay? And who had expertise in feeling and interpreting the spatial temporal pressure patterns of the aerial artery at least. So loosely translates to pulse, but in Ayurveda it's called nadi. Um, and he, he was adept at using this kind of information for diagnosis of different disorders. Uh, and Sri Ranga knew him and once he came to his house and he thought, Sri Ranga thought of me doing an impromptu experiment. What he did was he asked um, his wife, Srimati Vijayalakshmi, to meditate and then he told Supaya that she is unwell, could you please check her nadi and let me know what is going on, okay? So what happened was he tried to feel the pulse for an extended period of time, but he could not feel any pulse. And then he exclaimed, oh my god, she is dead. But Sri Ranga knew that not, that was not the case. What, what had happened was she was meditating in samadhi and what happens then is your metabolism, metabolic rate goes down enormously and that means that your heart rate and heart rate, respiration, everything slows down and becomes difficult to actually feel that pulse, okay? And then after a while, of course, she woke up and walked away to his amusement. <laughs> so what I want to, the points I want to make here is that a couple of things. So this kind of an experiment was done 70 years ago in a village, think about it. And even then this was, under those circumstances, a very well conducted experiment. Because Sri Ranga did not bias Subhaya by saying, I don't know, she's going to meditate, can you see and check and tell you what is going on. Just said that, you know, she's not well. So, can you check and see what's going on? Okay? And as I was saying, um, the state of Samadhi is defined as neither alive nor dead in our Shastras. The jivitam no maranam vichittam. So people who experience this state, the jivitam, neither alive, no maranam, neither dead, and vichitta. I mean, we are neither alive nor dead, it's kind of, it's all. They are trying to explain the state and find, find it very uh, unusual, neither alive nor dead. So this leads to the hypothesis that it might be an unusual state of consciousness, wherein metabolism is greatly suppressed. The most basic minimum amount required to sustain life and reactivate normal wakeful consciousness is only needed. So we talked about took them and what happens there and it will be interesting to see what their data they come up with but I just want to share another instance where they actually tried, they designed an experiment to get more physiological data using whatever was available then. So one of his disciples, Dr. Ganesh Rao, used a stethoscope and a thermometer. 70 years ago in a village, doctor, that's all they had. Um, to make more detailed physiological measurements, I have shown some of these metrics. Uh, there are other measurements taken, I don't have time to go to that. You can see pulse rate was measured, 72 per minute, heart rate 72 per minute during Samadhi, could not be detected. Could not be detected does not mean that, you know, it was not there, but <laughs> the manual detection and the, the cross instrumentation meant that it could not be detected. Um, same with breathing rate. What's interesting is body temperature. 97 degree Fahrenheit before and during Samadhi, 94 degree Fahrenheit. 
this kind of less it shows that there is some amount of body cooling during higher meditative state. So you can you can see the parallels. There is amount of body cooling. Cooling is conducive for reduced metabolic rate. Unable to detect pulse or pulse and uh, the heartbeat, the respiration are really slow. All of these indicate body cooling and signs of slow metabolism are consistent with the effects of hypothermia and anabiosis that I described. So this is so what what impresses me here is all of this was thought about 70 years ago. And when nobody even thought about looking at this from a scientific perspective, and you see parallels between the approach taken by him then and the approach taken by foremost neuroscientists today who recognize that this is kind of meditative state is something that falls in this gray area and, and worthy of scientific investigation. So I think that it's our responsibility to, for this is this agenda of using modern science and technology for understanding physiological influence of unusual states of consciousness which inhabit this gray area between life and death. So only when you understand this gray area between life and death, then you truly understand what is life and what is death. So can you understand why I am bringing this up? So it's a spectrum and you understand, need to understand all the uh, continuum in that spectrum to really understand what constitutes death. And of course this is also something that I clearly identify with, with disseminating such findings in the language of science so that they can be understood and appreciated by the current society. Because the current society trusts science and with good reason so. So my parting thoughts that when we come across such great individuals, and this is why I'm acknowledging it today, it transforms us in profound ways and inspires us to do things we would not have done otherwise. So but but for the fact that I came across this, I would have never been inspired to look at this I probably wouldn't be standing here, wouldn't be a scientist standing here and talking to you about this. And that's the reason why I wanted to acknowledge it. Okay? I think that's the last slide I have, and now it's open for questions. Thank you.